I'm Janet Walker, co-director of the National Wraparound Initiative, and I'm speaking to you today from our offices here at Portland State University in Oregon. Today's webinar is on staff recruitment and retention or replacement, and we have an extremely knowledgeable and experienced panel of presenters who will be introduced in just a minute. Before that, I'd like to go over a few announcements before we begin today's discussion. First of all, this webinar is brought to you in partnership with the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health, so our thanks goes out to them as well. Uh, during the presentation, we invite you to send your questions to the, uh, to the panelists uh, using the chat feature that's uh, down on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, if these are easy to answer, one of us may chat that response to you, but most of the questions will be held into the end uh, when the presenters will have a chance to respond. Also, it's important uh, to note that this webinar will be recorded and it will be posted to our website within a few hours of the conclusion. A link to access the recorded webinar or just the slides will be posted on the home page of the National Wraparound Initiative and I've put that address into the chat feature of your uh, webinar already so you can see that nwi.pdx.edu. Uh, we'll also have a series of polls today and those will also be posted if you're interested. Finally, I did just want to mention the training opportunity that's being offered this summer and co-sponsored by the National Wraparound Initiative. And this is the National Wraparound Implementation Academy that's going to be held July 14th and 15th here in Portland. Uh, this will be a chance, an, in, an intensive training experience with participants uh, signing up for one of several training tracks. And those range from policy to research and evaluation to supervision of facilitators and family partners, to integrating peer support for youth and young adults within Wraparound. Several of the tracks are actually almost full, so if you're interested, you might want to get on that right away. More information is also available uh, from the NWI's homepage. And with that, I would like to turn the proceedings over to Eric Bruns, uh, co-director of the NWI, who'll get us started with an overview of today's webinars and the introduction of some key themes for today. Thanks. Thank you, Janet, and uh, good afternoon to most of you. Good morning to those of you on the Pacific Coast here where uh, Janet and myself both are. I'm here in Seattle, Washington at the University of Washington, um, and uh, it is a uh, delight to uh, be co-director of the National Wraparound Initiative with Janet and to be able to co-host today's uh, webinar on facilitating staff recruitment and retention. This is a topic that's really near and dear to our hearts here at the National Wraparound Initiative. Um, we know that the um, wraparound staff, care coordinators, supervisors, uh, parent and youth peer-to-peer -peer support uh, workers or peer partners, um, they are the ones on the front lines who make wraparound actually happen for families and ensure that uh, families aren't left to their own devices to navigate very complicated systems um, when their uh, uh, child or youth or young adult um, is in fact struggling with uh, complex needs. Uh, but at the same time, if we expect uh, these folks who are working directly with uh, families and youth, um, these care coordinators, these facilitators, these peer partners, to do it all themselves, if we, if we put the burden of responsibility just on them to make the principles of wraparound happen, um, and the activities of wraparound care coordination. This is a recipe for burnout and uh, something that um, leads to staff turnover that is pretty uh, common in the human services field, but is more common when the staff uh, in question are not well supported by their uh, host organizations and the systems in which they're working. So, in, you know, basically the bottom line is, is that, uh, and you can go ahead to the next slide there, John. Um, uh, today's webinar, we're really going to talk about how it takes hard work by organizations such as the provider agencies and care management entities that uh, hire and host um, these critical uh, wraparound staff. Uh, it takes hard work on their behalf as well as by systems um, and the leaders in systems to make wraparound work in the real world. Uh, it's incumbent upon programs and systems to really be thinking about how best to ensure uh, that we uh, hire the right staff um, and retain them um, by providing them the support that they need. So that's the second point from today's webinar, is, is that, that that human resource support is a big part of the puzzle. When we first started the National Wraparound Initiative in 2004, 
um, we were really um, focused initially on defining, uh, better defining the practice model for wraparound care coordination, the principles, um, and so forth, so we could better measure uh, quality and fidelity, better train and support staff to do these complicated jobs. But along the way, we've seen and learned from implementation science um, and other disciplines that there are very uh, specific types of ways to post uh, job announcements that get the right uh, individuals applying for these jobs. Uh, there, are the, there are ways to interview folks. There are ways to hire folks. The training and skill development of the staff who are in these roles is critically important for them feeling competent and satisfied in their job. Um, and then finally, that at, at a macro level, organizational policies, climate and culture, and the system conditions in which people work um, are um, also extraordinarily important to ensuring that we reduce um, staff turnover to, to a minimum, increase the satisfaction and skill with which uh, these staff do their jobs. So that's the third point today. There are ways to ensure that staff recruitment and retention is successful, but it really takes going the extra mile uh, by uh, leaders in um, the, the host organizations as well as in systems. And so in this webinar, we're going to provide examples of ways to do this. Who we have with us today, in addition to Janet and myself, um, are Kim Coviello and Lisa Garland uh, from the Institute for Innovation and Implementation at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Uh, the Institute um, at the University of Maryland is uh, the third partner in the National Wraparound Implementation Center, along with Portland State and the University of Washington. And so Kim and Lisa are going to be talking about ways in which the Institute and the National Wraparound Implementation Center uh, provides technical assistance around hiring uh, and uh, staff retention uh, ways in which to ensure we uh, hire the right folks with the right skills and then keep them in those positions doing good work with families. And then our final presenters are going to be, um, and we want to thank them so much for being panelists on this webinar, some folks who are really going to talk from their experiences uh, the last couple of years at the South Carolina Continuum of Care. We have Bina Peak and uh, Trina Cornelson, um, Client Services Director and Executive Director from the South Carolina Continuum of Care and they're going to speak from their experiences about some very specific ways in which they have attempted to ensure that they get the right staff in the right jobs um, and, and keep them in those jobs uh, so that a statewide, a very innovative and um, exciting statewide wraparound initiative um, is as effective as possible. Uh, so just by way of introduction, go ahead to the next slide. Um, this is, a, like I was saying, we founded the National Wraparound Initiative in about 2004. And at the time, our perception was is that you know we, people were really rallying around wraparound principles, such as family voice and choice, being team-based, uh, relying on natural supports um, as much as professionals wherever possible, uh, and so forth. And that uh, when we were kind of starting up NWI, there was a little bit of a gap in understanding how you get from principles to positive outcomes for youth and families. Um, go ahead and animate the next uh, part there. To some extent, we almost felt as though the, the whole picture was, uh, was like this, that uh, we're going to adhere to the principles and we're really looking for positive outcomes and somewhere in the middle a miracle is going to occur. Well, you know, NWI and all of the advisors uh, who spent uh, countless hours with us trying to define the practice model a little bit more ex explicitly, go ahead to the next slide, um, really spent a lot of time working on the phases of wraparound and the activities that uh, care coordinators needed to be supported and trained to undertake with uh, families. Um, and so many folks on the line probably know uh, that, you know, there are now some uh, much greater um, specificity of the activities of wraparound and the National Wraparound Implementation Center now is uh, working hard in at least uh, 10 or 12 states and sites across the country to train staff to be able to effectively understand and implement uh, the activities and phases of wraparound. But like, and if you want more information about this, then feel free to go to the NWI website and go to the resource guide uh, to wraparound and, and find uh, some articles on the details here. But we're not really focusing on this because what we, today, because what we found along the way, go ahead to the next slide, is that even when you have a well-defined practice model, even when you have developed uh, fidelity measures that you're uh, collecting uh, data with, feeding those data back, um, there's, there still is um, uh, 
so many opportunities, so many places in systems and organizations where the implementation gap raises its, uh, its rears its ugly head. Even when, so even when you have a well-defined practice model and uh, good outcomes data that show that when it, things are working well and being implemented um, as we hope, uh, good outcomes occur, that doesn't mean that the next site or state that's looking to implement wraparound is actually going to achieve the same outcomes. There are not always clear pathways to implementation. And often what is adopted well in one place with fidelity and good effect doesn't occur in the next place. And what, what is implemented will dis disappear over time and with staff turnover if we don't attend to, again, program and system conditions. So go ahead to the next slide. What we're going to talk about today uh, in, in greater detail is ways in which we hope that systems and programs uh, strive to overcome that ever so common implementation gap. Um, to overcome that implementation gap from theory to actual practice on the ground with families and youth, uh, one thing to do is to apply implementation science. So if we are looking to achieve, uh, to achieve positive youth and family outcomes, um, go ahead and slow down a little bit there. Uh, John, back up one slide, one, one animation. Um, we want to get, in fact, to uh, sustainable program fidelity. Um, we, have a, you know, we have a theory that says that uh, uh, well-implemented wraparound is going to be a way to get to more positive youth and family outcomes. Um, and so we do have fidelity measures that help keep people on track and that we use in our research studies. But what is behind achieving uh, the wraparound practice in the way that we intend? Well, uh, implementation science suggests that there are three big factors that we have to be looking to in, in organizations uh, and programs. Competency drivers, organization drivers, and leadership drivers. Now you can go ahead, John. Go with one more. So at, at the leadership level, there's technical and adaptive leadership. But look over on the left-hand side, competency drivers. What we're going to be talking about today is the critical importance of staff selection, staff training, and staff coaching and supervision to achieving uh, high-level um, fidelity to the wraparound model, or any human service model for that matter, uh, that's going to facilitate positive youth and family outcomes. Um, go ahead, one more, John. Um, at the organizational level, facilitative administra administration and systems interventions are also really important. So we have to also be paying attention to how services and systems are organized. And uh, go ahead, one more. Um, and so here's some of the uh, things that the National Wraparounds identified at the system level that are so critical to focus on. Are our systems, in fact, characterized by good collaborative action across systems and partners? Do we have the right fiscal policies in place? Is there a good uh, and appropriate and accessible continuum of supports and services for these wraparound teams to access? Uh, accountability and data systems are critical. But you see that second to last bullet there at the system level, human resource development and support. That's where we're really going to be focusing today. All of these things together, one more uh, advance there, John. Uh, staff selection, training, and coaching. One more. Facilitative administration and human resource development and support at the system level. These are the things that are really critical uh, in the implementation science kind of uh, conceptualization uh, that we need to be paying attention to and that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, go ahead to the next slide. So whether you are a manager in a uh, organization that hosts uh, wraparound staff or you are a system leader or participating in some way in the system, here are some of the questions that we can be asking ourselves uh, in terms of how well our system and our program is set up to actually support the staff at the ground level. Um, these are available in the implementation guide to wraparound on our, on our website, these kinds of questions. And here are some things we want you to think about in terms of your own wraparound initiative or program. Do you have job expectations? Uh, that allow um, wraparound staff like facilitators and uh, parent partners the adequate time, flexibility, and resources to implement high-quality wraparound? Are your caseload sizes appropriate to allow them to consistently and thoroughly complete the activities of wraparound? Do they receive comprehensive training? Do they shadow experienced workers prior to working independently? Do they get coaching that focuses on developing their skills? 
and giving them feedback about whether or not they are expressing the, the uh, needed skills for wraparound. Do they get good and regular individual and group supervision? And that question that is uh, always on so many people's minds, is our compensation adequate for the complexity and the difficulty of the job that these wraparound staff do? And is that compensation uh, reflective of their value and at a level that's going to encourage staff retention and commitment? These are the kinds of questions that we hope that you ask yourselves um, after this webinar and ask what could you do to achieve higher levels of, uh, of these kinds of um, factors that are so critical to uh, uh, retaining skilled staff in your wraparound initiative. And with that, um, I think what we want to do now is I'm going to hand the um, presentation over to Janet Walker, who's going to talk about these uh, points number three and four and their roles in ensuring uh, well-prepared staff who are likely to um, uh, be able to both be skillful wraparound workers as well as likely to um, uh, stay on in those roles. Um, comprehensive training um, and supervision and coaching. But first, John, perhaps uh, launch our first poll. Th throughout this uh, webinar, we're going to ask you a few questions that relate to this self-assessment, and we hope that you'll take the time to answer this first question about your own wraparound initiative. So relevant to those uh, five or six um, self-assessment questions, here's, here's a question for you. Uh, think about your organization or your wraparound initiative and ask uh, one of those questions of your own uh, uh, um, program or project. Do you have caseload sizes that allow staff to complete the activities of the wraparound process effectively? And select one of these options. Yes, definitely. Not quite, but we're almost there. Not really, but we're working on this. And the last option is not really, and we really don't have any plans to try and work on this. So go ahead and, and vote, and uh, while we're tallying the results, I'll hand the presenting over to uh, back to Janet in Portland. Okay, thanks, Eric. I am just going to get started, and um, we'll go back to the poll in just a second when everybody has voted. So as Eric mentioned, if you remember on the previous slide, there were some um, elements of uh, scoring your system on human resources development and support. And I think it's not hard to see how, how factors such as uh, job expectations, do people actually have the time to do what they're expected to do? Do they have caseload sizes that allow them to do uh, work that lives up to uh, what is expected? Uh, compensation and career advancement. Uh, those things, in a, I think, in a very intuitive way, we see as being linked to um, people's desire to stay with their job. And I'm thinking we're going to see, can we see the poll results now? Um, Just one second. Okay. And I was just, uh, okay, so, Oh, it's kind of interesting results there that we see a f almost exactly even split between people who are definitely there and actively working on it, uh, but sort of just getting started. And only a very small minority of people, 10%, 1 in 10, who are really in organizations that are not working to actively address or have made substantial progress as far as caseload sizes. Okay, thanks, John. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, as I mentioned, I think it's very intuitive that some of these things are, are linked to staff retention, and indeed there's a very robust literature across all sorts of different occupational categories. Can you go back up a little bit, uh, back up to the last one, um, on, these, uh, on these particular uh, contributors to um, retention or uh, to people leaving their jobs. So I did want to focus a little bit on three and four. As, as Eric mentioned, these uh, sort of uh, related to training, uh, coaching, and supervision, where you kind of get a twofer um, because not only are these keys, to obviously once you create a highly skilled wraparound workforce, you are going to get better outcomes, but additionally at the same time, having high quality training, coaching, and supervision contributes to people's desire to stay with their organization, uh, decreasing uh, burnout and um, 
and turnover. So next slide, please. So uh, looking at the research that is actually specifically focused on community psychology and social work, uh, here are just a few excerpts. One is, the uh, first one here starts with the idea of high quality supervision. I'm going to get into in a little bit what that um, is uh, entails because uh, almost all of these uh, relationships are reversed if supervision is not so high quality. So high quality supervision has been associated with decreased burnout or emotional exhaustion, turnover and tension, and actual turnover among clinicians. And there you'll see just some among uh, many citations for that. Staff development reduces turnover and tension among social workers, and high quality supervision is negatively associated with burnout and positively associated with attachment to the organization. Uh, performance feedback is a key intrinsic motivator, and we'll see in a minute that feedback is, again, an essential element of high-quality supervision. Uh, and the most useful function of social work supervision is educational. Um, but it should also be pointed out, uh, and again, a point that we'll return to, that uh, having a good relationship within the supervision dyad or group is also uh, very important. Okay, next please. So just as sort of in summary, high quality supervision, and again that includes the coaching aspect, is linked to increased intrinsic motivation, attachment to the organization, lower burnout, and lower turnover. And uh, certainly the suggestion is that uh, partially this is because it acts as a buffer against stress and we know that uh, the wraparound environment, uh, the situations that wraparound uh, is called in for are can be highly stressful for all team members on wraparound um, because often wraparound is kind of working at that juncture or that that kind of uh, place where systems rub up to get against each other. Sometimes there's quite a bit of friction involved in that. And additionally, because of course we're committed to kids and families and uh, sometimes there's a lot of uh, struggle going on. So now just briefly want to turn to what are the components of high quality supervision. So next slide, please. So uh, this is actually, a stop there, we're going too far. Uh, okay. This is actually one of my favorite slides. Uh, uh, I've shown it a lot over the years. Um, and it actually is, as uh, you can see from the bottom, it was developed originally out of um, information that summarized studies in education, of which there are a lot. Uh, however, and um, similar results can certainly be uh, extracted from the literature on social work. Uh, I just like how this particular graph turned out because of the number, large number of studies and the obvious relevance of uh, transfer of training to practice that happens for teachers in a classroom who are learning how to, uh, I would say perform, but maybe that's not the greatest word, but a new skill, a uh, new practice, how uh, to actually change what they're doing in the classroom. So the way this works is over on the left hand side is a scale that's called effect size and basically that's a way of uh, putting on a common scale a whole bunch of different studies so that they're all, they're all, uh, you can represent them all, all at once without distorting the findings of, of individual studies. So basically if you say that a, an intervention has an effect size of zero, that basically means that nothing happened uh, relative to how things were before or relative to the control group, however you want to describe it. At a 0.5, uh, you're actually finding a pretty decent effect and around one would be a large effect. Anything over that is really quite excellent. So on the, if you see what we're going to go first to knowledge. So this is building knowledge about how to do a new practice. Uh, across the bottom, you'll see that these are sort of increasingly adding the elements of high quality supervision. And again, we're including the coaching piece there. So first you teach some theory like why should you be doing this and kind of what is it, just sort of a description of it. After that, this is new practice, you're adding in a demonstration of what does it look like this would most likely be could be a video demonstration, but most likely it would be a, a kind of a can demonstration done in front of, a, of your training group. Uh, then the addition of the opportunity for trainees to practice, then to practice with structured feedback. Uh, and so this feedback would be uh, ideally using some kind of reliable feedback measure or instrument that, that uh, can tell with some degree of certainty. When we mean reliable, it means that different people using this measure would be providing similar feedback. So the feedback doesn't depend on whether I'm the one who's looking at you or Eric's looking at you, but it's actually consistent and independent of the 
um, person providing the feedback. And then finally we have this coaching which in all involves um, the observation of the person in the field plus um, all of the other elements and uh, as noted before. So we see that knowledge can be built relatively quickly, um, a little bit of theory plus some demonstration and you get people are able to describe to you what the practice change should look like. So if we add in the next one, skill, John, you can see that skill building uh, is also maybe not that hard to develop up to, uh, we're talking about that kind of reasonable 0.5 level. Now this should be mentioned that this skill is demonstrating the skill and this is typically going to be uh, in a you know kind of classroom, not a, 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 a training environment, so not in a real environment. But when we get to actual practice change, and in this case this was teachers actually doing something different in their classes, you can see that there was absolutely no impact until you got to the more robust uh, elements of um, kind of support for training, uh, transfer of training to practice. So all the way up to theory theory plus demonstration plus practice and even with feedback still not really getting a very robust response or people actually taking what they were learning and implementing them in the classroom. But the good news here is that with that coaching in addition uh, the, uh, the, the bar there, the orange bar goes way up to the point where there's a really significant impact uh, and transfer of training. Next please. So um, it's, uh, we started, um, this was probably f about four and a half years ago, uh, there was a recognition from the field in wraparound that, um, that or an, a request to the NWI that we put out a statement that talked about what we expected would be done uh, for wraparound, uh, this was for facilitators in particular, uh, so that they would be adequately have adequate support for their learning and to be able to work effectively with families. Um, so this is a document. Again, you can access this on the NWI website. Probably the easiest way is just to enter the name of the document into the search. Um, go to the next slide, please, John. So the demand from the field was really um, in, people felt that. Um, that practice needed to be we call it protected. That there were, there were often people who were being hired, and we heard about this really uh, not. It was not an uncommon thing that uh, new people would be put out to work with families before they had actually received any training at all. So obviously. Um, people were coming to us and saying, you know, we need a set of, of expectations so that people aren't put into these untenable situations uh, as, as um, novice practitioners and also the, so that families and youth can have some expectation that the person that's working with them actually knows what they're doing. Um, so we went at this with the basic goal of setting expectations that were consistent with those with a high quality practice and that would help to develop high quality practice but that also could be affordable and feasible in uh, your basic everyday wraparound context. So I'm not going to go through all the steps, but essentially we worked with uh, the membership of the National Wraparound Initiative. We had a work group that was working on this, and we had a final version uh, after several rounds of feedback from our most experienced um, and expert uh, core NWI group. So this was finally published almost exactly two years ago in 2013. So very briefly, next please. Um, I think this, uh, this table which is included within the document does a really nice job of summarizing um, what we expect uh, for a high quality training and coaching approach to uh, staff development in wraparound. And you will find as I go through this, it's very, very consistent with the research that I was citing earlier. So. Um, we have, I'm just again going to go over this briefly, but uh, three phases that we see. Phase one orientation being what you need to know before you get started at all um, and before you work with your first family. And that would include, again, we see the main components, basic history and overview of wraparound, kind of what's it all about, an introduction to the skills and competencies, and a chance to be exposed to sort of the main activities that are part of the wraparound process and probably to practice them in that training situation. And when that training is completed, then you have been oriented and you're ready, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to start seeing 
uh, working with families. However, this begins in phase two. Working with families begins by the trainee being an apprentice or, or observing someone who is highly skilled uh, to get a sense of what what it should look like when it's done well. And through the phase two, this kind of transition from the apprentice observing the expert to the other way around. Um, and you can see that there are some key features of this that the uh, the expert person uh, has some uh, is highly experienced that there's a structured process for providing that feedback in a way that's going to uh, be maximally helpful to the trainee and again the use of reliable assessments so that everyone can be confident that it's not just uh, the individual person's whim or what they happen to see but actually that this is something that is coming with some degree of authority saying this is this is somewhat an objective uh, assessment of the person's practice and then once a person uh, has done a certain number of, of observation once their score kind of exceeds a certain threshold on uh, on the uh, assessment uh, and passing a knowledge test then the person has gotten to phase three. Uh, I think we typically think of this as taking at least six months, again, to get to that trans transition of being the, uh, the very novice apprentice to, to passing through that apprenticeship stage. And then at phase three is kind of the ongoing phase where you continue to build your expertise and there's, you know, some degree of ongoing coaching and periodic observation, etc. And um, that Ultimately, we want to see facilitators who become very expert to be the innovators in their organizations and, and systems and help to, to make wraparound vibrant and uh, always changing and adapting. And if you see down at the bottom, uh, the arrow there is um, kind of emphasizing that training, coaching, and supervision is provided in a way that's consistent with the principles of wraparound. And we already talked about it sort of uh, based in um, in data, for example, but also that it's strengths-based and that it's focused on building a positive and mutual relationship between the supervisor and the coach, uh, supervisor slash coach may or may not be the same person, and the person who's learning. So that um, brings it back to the research that I was talking about in the beginning, the fact that relationship dimension is very important also um, in, uh, in retention of workers. So I think, if you want to go to the next slide, I think that's it for me, actually. Oh, well, I kind of mentioned about all of this, so I'm not, gonna, not really going to go over it. I think we're ready for the next poll and then the transition to the next speaker. So, John, if you could mention, uh, open the next poll for us, please. Sure thing. Yeah, so here's, here's one that's very relevant to what Janet was just describing. Do the staff in your wraparound initiative or program actually receive training, job shadowing, and ongoing coaching in ways uh, that uh, are similar to what Janet was just describing that the NWI put out there as guidance. Um, while you're voting on that, let me just uh, take a moment to introduce our next uh, speakers, um, Kim Coviello and Lisa Garland. We're going to start getting into some of the details about how to um, not just train and coach uh, wraparound staff, which is something that they do all across the country, but also how to set up your programs uh, and, orga and organizations to hire and retain them as best as possible. So let's take a look at our results and then we'll hand it over to uh, Kim and Lisa. Okay, one moment. Yeah. Well, personally, I find this very reinforcing and encouraging seeing that. Uh, Pretty much half people feel that they uh, are working in places that are definitely including these components. I, I would have to say that um, I believe this is a, an improvement over how things have been in the not so distant past. Um, and again, another 35% almost there. So that to me seems quite impressive. I'm very impressed with that. I don't think we would have found that five years ago. And largely it's thanks to the effort of folks like Kim and Lisa, who I'm going to now hand over the controls to. Well, thank you. Um, so you can see that first slide, and it's a little bit, we're going to start to talk here about actual staff rec recruitment and retention. And it's a little bit fuzzy, but um, the little guy on the left says, uh, we serve with a smile. Um, and then the other guy says, uh, we love doing this, and it shows. And really the point we're trying to get across here is 
that we need to be intentional about recruiting and hiring and retaining staff. Um, we want happy people. We want their um, we want a best fit. We want their skill set um, to be suited for the work that we do in rep rounds. And so we want to make sure staff are enjoying what they're doing. Um, if you go to the next slide here. So um, so first we're just going to start to um, discuss uh, staff selection and rep rounds. So really being intentional about hiring. Okay. And so as Eric mentioned earlier. We have three types of implementation drivers. You talked about the competency, the organization, and the leadership. And we know that while it takes all of these pieces working together to recruit and retain quality staff, one of the first and often one of the most um, essential steps in the process to building a competent wraparound workforce is selecting the right person for the right job. With this in mind, we're going to take a few moments and talk a little bit about things that we found to be effective approaches for recruiting, interviewing, and hiring. Um, care coordinators, family partners, um, and also supervisors and wrap around. Next slide, please. All right. So in selecting staff, one of the things that we need to ensure that we do is that we're preparing appropriately um, for hiring and for beginning to interview staff. So what oftentimes happens, I think, when we're hiring care coordinators um, is that we tend to look for the alignment of values. Um, many people seem to believe that when applicants come in the door with the right values, they can oftentimes be taught many of the skill sets that are needed to be effective facilitators. And while we all believe that these values and the alignment of the values with wraparound are really an important piece of the selection process, Values alone are not necessarily going to be indicative of whether an applicant has the right skill set um, to be successful in their role of a care coordinator or even a care coordinator supervisor. Oops. I think I lost my screen. Um, so some of the things that we need to think about is we need to think about intentionally designing interviewing activities to target concrete skill sets that candidates already bring to the table when they walk in the door. And these should be things that we know are already essential for the position. So for example, some of the skill sets that we know effective care coordinators need to have is they need to be able to have the ability to maintain a strength orientation. They need to be collaborative and be able to work well with others. They need to be able to demonstrate uh, manage, how they can manage conflict, um, elicit, blend multiple perspectives together, and even something so simple as being comfortable standing up in front of the group. And all of these skills are things that should be looked at and targeted in care coordinator candidates um, during the interviewing process. So again, it's about trying to target those concrete skill sets that we know will help us to select the candidate that's the best fit for the, for the position, and also being able to select somebody who has skill sets already embodied within themselves that they can move into the new role. Another piece that we also need to be focused on when we're preparing to select candidates is how we clearly defined our expectations. And do applicants and interviewees really understand the essential requirements of the position that they're going to be interviewing and possibly hired for? So again, do candidates clearly understand how this job as a care coordinator is going to be different from, from positions that they may have had in the past, such as a case manager, a clinician, even a skills trainer? Are they aware that the position is going to require them to work a lot of hours outside of the normal work day? Um, and that this is going to be something that's expected on a regular basis. Do they feel comfortable providing 24-hour crisis response to the families that they work with? And do they also understand that they'll not just be working with kids and families, but that their job as a care coordinator will be to build and facilitate teams, manage and resolve conflict, build consensus among different systems and individuals, and track progress and outcomes? Finally, we also need to think about whether or not we're clearly communicating the mission of wraparound and whether or not we're helping applicants and interviewees to understand that their mission as a care coordinator is going to be to do whatever it takes to help keep kids in their homes and communities. Again, do applicants understand that wraparound is not just another stop um, on the way to our next out-of-home placement and that their job is to create long-term sustainable 
change and growth for families, again, by working with a team? Do they also truly believe in some of the values, such as that the worst home is better than the best placement? And are they able to bring the skills to come to the table with ideas about how they can, how we can best support kids and families to live successfully in their communities rather than in programs? Next slide. So we also want to talk about um, staff selection for parent care partners also. Um, and so we need to look at them in a different way. And we need to um, think about what we need. So what's the most effective way to really recruit and really target um, the right people for the right position? And so when you're posting to the, the position, so um, word of mouth is usually effective. And we really need to think about some things. Um, we really need to be able to access parents with that lived experience. Um, so oftentimes you'll hear us talk, talking about looking for legacy parents, um, parents that have been there, kind of in these same shoes. Um, one of the best places to look for parent peer partners are alumni families, families who have successfully transitioned um, from wraparound. And from that, you generally find um, parent peer partners and youth peer partners. Um, so you can have that peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, so again, the best resources are really families that are being served in, in wraparound. And so you need to be really clear, just as with the care coordinators or uh, RAP facilitators, be really clear about the description and have some clear expectations um, and some clear explanations of their role. Um, a resume is helpful. Um, but conversation and role play are usually a great indicator. Um, trying to target families. Um, who have really seen and experienced positive outcomes from wraparound and, and if they can, you know, listening for them to be able to talk about those experiences and talk about their benefits um, from participating in wraparound is really great. Um, so we're looking for a parent of a child with emotional or behavioral changes um, that has been working within a system because it's, it's difficult to navigate systems. Um, the ability to empathize with others, um, some problem solving skills, um, communication and listening skills, um, being culturally competent. So these are really different. Um, these are really different roles and really different skill sets. And we want to make sure again that we're we're finding the right people that so we find the right fit um, for the work that we're doing. Next slide, please. Okay. So, um, so now, oh, go ahead. Sorry. So now we're going to talk about what actually works in terms of interviewing um, for the quality practitioners in wraparound, whether they be care coordinators or family partners, um, and how you really ensure that you're targeting the skill set that you're looking for effectively during this interviewing process. So one of the things that we have found to be really, really um, impactful is the importance of including real families and young people in the interview process and eliciting feedback from them. So this can be done in many ways, and we've seen some really creative things um, out there in the field as we and I work around the country. Some of the things that we've seen that have been highly effective, though, have been having interviewees um, possibly shadow care coordinators um, and have the opportunity to go to the field during that interviewing process and interacting with real families. Um, we've also seen folks who have organized waiting room interactions. So, for example, applicants um, maybe have to wait in the waiting room, and the organization has brought in real families um, to be in that waiting room with them. Um, and there's an observation that would occur where you would see um, how that individual interacts, do they interact, um, sort of what, you know, are some of their body language um, or verbal telling you. Um, in terms of how comfortable they feel with families. We've also seen um, applicants, as part of the interviewing process, really have to engage with real families um, and try to build rapport and gather information. Um, so there's a lot of options around that. Another option that also um, has been used and has been very successful is involving parents and youth in the actual interviews with candidates and encouraging them to pose questions around things that families and young people see to be important in a care coordinator. So again, when you're thinking about the families, would this individual um, really help families to feel comfortable opening up and sharing their experiences? Um, is this somebody that they feel like could help them achieve their goals and their vision of a better future? 
is the candidate able to interact in ways that are family friendly, non judgmental, and respectful? Some other activities in the interviewing process that have been used um, have been posing behavioral examples and situations. Um, this can be a very powerful tool for really assessing competencies in care coordinators. And these types of questions really provide interviewers with the opportunity to get a deeper understanding of what applicants would do and how they would respond um, or approach certain situations in practice. Similarly, we found that posing questions that target the values of wraparound and then create opportunities to assess how individuals would actually apply those values into their practice, even under challenging circumstances, can be very effective. So do interviewees' answers align with the values of wraparound and those of your organization? Do they understand not only what those values are, but how they can be applied to the work that they're doing with families and young people, as well as teams? Are they going to be able to consistently implement those values into their practice across all families and teams that they partner with? And finally, we also can suggest that you consider conducting group interviews. So of course, one option here is to bring in a panel of staff, which often happens. Um, it may include a care coordinator or several care coordinators at the organization, parent peer support partners, supervisors, um, youth support even. But another extremely effective alternative to having a staff panel is to have interviewees interview together. And so although this might sound different from kind of that traditional interviewing technique, um, we need to remember, again, as Lisa said, that we're looking for different skill sets in care coordinators. And we want to ensure that we're selecting individuals that have natural skill sets, such as they're, they're leaders. They're able to demonstrate that they can bring people and ideas together. They're able to hone in on strengths and needs. And they're creative. So an example of how you might do this would be you might provide applicants with a sample family story and have them work together during the interview to develop a plan of care. As an interviewer, you would watch to see how they interact, who emerges as a leader in the group, how they handle conflict or disagreement. Um, another option is you could also have interviewees conduct a mock child and family team meeting. Um, they could give a brief presentation to the group, or even um, something that we've seen that was very interesting is have them interview um, another applicant and then try and explain why that person is the most qualified individual for the job. The rationale behind that being um, that if an applicant has skill to gather information, identify and communicate strengths, and generate buy-in, um, they have a lot of the skill sets that they're going to need to be effective as a care coordinator. So again, it's really about looking to see if the, ap the applicant is able to demonstrate some of those basic skill sets that are needed for the position, and whether or not they can be taught to integrate some of the newer skill sets that are specific to the wraparound practice into their practice with children and families. Next slide. Here we just included just a few examples of some of the interviewing questions that we have used um, and found to be effective in hiring and selecting new staff. Um, these are sample questions that could be used with care coordinators. Um, we've also used them when hiring for supervisors um, and others in the field. So just like Kim said, we um, we use some of these questions and we put these scenarios out there like you see in that first case um, with the 12-year-old boy who's scheduled to go to a therapy session. And so we um, we set up these scenarios and just try to find out, you know, uh, where the applicant is in terms of their skill set and how they would handle these kinds of things and, and look for alignment in the wraparound values. Um, and hiring supervisors um, who might be responsible for clinical oversight, then we would actually um, change, we've added some questions or we would change some of the questions so that um, we would look for, uh, we would intentionally ask different questions to get to that clinical skill set and supervisors. Um, I know one of the questions that we, or one of the scenarios that we developed was having um, a scenario where there's a seven-year-old boy who is maybe experiencing some psychosis and has a history of trauma. And so can they, what we're looking for then is can they, do they recognize the fact 
that trauma in a really young boy is rare and can they look at the trauma and can they make those connections and so um, we really do have to think again about being intentional about the questions that we ask when we're looking for supervisors especially if they're going to be able to provide that clinical oversight um, next slide please so um, so just like Kim was talking about with um, the group observation interview for facilitators, then we also have to consider um, some group observation interviews for parent partners as well. And so in this um, in this scenario, we would um, we would have a group of potential parent peer partner applicants that are interviewed together. And so maybe they're given you know a short presentation about the role of the parent peer partner, um, wrap around and the organizational uh, the organization's values. And so then the group would be asked to discuss among themselves what they heard. And so uh, as an interviewer, what we want to do is we want to just observe the discussion and, and look for some of those things. Again, some of the things that Tim was talking about with facilitators, but we want to look at these specific things um, related to the parent-peer partner role. And so um, we want to look to see, do they have direct experiences in, with systems? Um, what resources have they found to be more, most helpful? Can they speak about those things that they have found to be most helpful? Um, do they have an opinion about how parents should be involved in their child's care? And so do they advocate for parents being the experts in their own families? Um, we want to see the benefits of having, the benefits they see in having peer partners involved in delivering those services and support, either for parents or youth or, or professionals involved. And so we want to really listen to their discussion in the group um, about those benefits, um, especially if we have families who have been alumni in you know in the wraparound process and have transitioned out successfully transitioned out of wraparound can they talk about the benefits and, and do they see the benefit and can they see how they reach positive outcomes um, and navigate the system and then what changes they would make um, what changes they they think should be made within the child serving system um, and we want to look for things like community resources or information they thought had been helpful and how they've been able to accept them, access those um, and any other things about them we think might be helpful. Um, next slide. So I remember we're looking for those lived experiences because, um, you know, like Toby said, we can we can teach wraparound, um, but you may not always be able to teach those values and perspectives. And so we're really listening for that. Um, and just as we want to be clear in the role of supervisor, in the role of care coordinator, facilitator, we also need to be really clear with the role of a parent peer support and how it's different and really what's required from that. And so in that, um, what we want to be sure is that we're, um, we, wa we want to be sure that we're letting them know, you know, that they'll be learning how and when to tell their story um, and really be intentional about sharing their story um, so that we can get the when and the when and what and how to tell to really instill hope for families because that's the, at the end of the day that's what we want to do is be able to instill hope and have families know hey I've been in this position I've lived some of these things and I've been through you know I've come out on the other side pretty successful um, so we do ask parents uh, to discuss their experiences with other systems as well mental health systems child welfare juvenile justice um, and in previous inter question, previous interview questions, similar to the care coordinators, um, but used only after a group interview and selection process. So we want to be intentional about those questions, questions that we ask. Um, and lastly, if the physician, because many of many of states are moving to a position where parent peer partners um, is actually Medicaid billable. So what we want to do also is we want to have maybe a writing sample and we want to ask um, some computer competency, maybe have a quick test that might be helpful. Because um, we really do, they need to have concrete skills to ensure um, that they can um, they can demonstrate these written, written and computer skill sets. Okay, next slide. All right, so now that we have found the right individual, to hire, how are we going to ensure that we're able to keep them and retain them for the long haul? So that's where we're going to move next. Next slide. So again, we come back to our implementation drivers. And previously, we were focused on competency and selecting staff. And now we're going to move over to the organization driver around facilitative administration. And again, this is where our focus begins to shift 
um, for developing an organizational structure and culture and climate that's really going to support not only high quality and fidelity implementation of wraparound, but that's going to support staff and make them want to stay um, in those jobs that they've been hired to do. Next slide. So when we start to think about staff retention, we need to consider effective organizational um, supervisory structures. And so if you look at this slide, on the left-hand side, we've got, um, we've got the care coordinator, and then on the right-hand side, we've got the care support. And each of these is the same. So some things to consider are the, um, the recommendations for staffing ratios. So again, for parent, or peer partners and for care coordinators, the ratio is going to be one supervisor to seven staff. So seven facilitators, um, one supervisor for seven parent peer partners. Um, and then when we look at um, when we look at how many families we serve, when we look at the recommended recommended staffing ratios, we're really seeing one to ten is the max um, for both. So we would be working with at the max we would be working with ten families. Some things to consider, um, you know, we have to be intentional about um, having an organization and developing an organization so staff can be successful, so staff can feel successful around these different components. Um, because again, if we only have um, staff that feel successful in the job that they're doing, you know, wraparound is hard enough. When they feel successful in the in the work that they're doing, then they really do um, they want to stay in their job. They, we have happy employees that want to stay in their job. So, just some things to consider when you're thinking about organizing your um, supervisory structure are, you know, you're having an agency director, having you know, finance, HR, business manager. Having a provider network coordinator, someone that can be um, that person that does that PR, someone who can be the face of wraparound and do some community education with your community stakeholders, your child serving agencies in the community, um, to be able to form partnerships and really provide some education around, you know, what is this wraparound thing that's coming into town, so that they understand how they can partner together and work together. Um, and things like 24-7 crisis response. You know, do we have, how do we handle holidays? How do we handle after hours? Do we have an on-call uh, crisis calendar where um, families can access so that we don't have the same staff having to respond all the time and can we maybe share some of that accountability? Um, and regular, uh, regular supervision and access to supervision. And I know, um, that lots of lots of places do group supervision, individual supervision, but do staff really have protected time where they can meet with their supervisor and really start to build skill around the process itself? And lastly, uh, self care. So thinking about creating an organization, creating a place where um, we know the work is hard, we know wraparound is hard, but it's also the most rewarding work that many of us have done in the field. And so, do we have a place where uh, that values staff care? Next slide, please. Okay, so when thinking about retaining staff, we also need to think about that this may require shifts um, to improve organizational climate um, and culture. And so some of the areas that we want to consider is around support. Do staff really feel like they have the support that they need at all levels of the organization to do their jobs effectively? Are they being provided with those necessary tools, the training, the supervisory support um, that Janet spoke about earlier, um, in order to develop those concrete skill sets that are needed for wraparound implementation? Um, also, as Lisa mentioned, do they feel like their supervisor um, is somebody who supports them, who has the skills and knowledge needed also to help them grow and develop um, as care coordinators or family partners? The next point being, do they feel connected and cared about by somebody internally at their organization? Do we intentionally think about creating mentorships for staff, um, encourage them to work collaboratively with their colleagues? Um, do we organize for peer support internally at organizations? Staff also need to feel valued. Um, and one of the most important pieces is creating opportunities for staff to have fun helping staff to feel recognized and rewarded for all of their hard work and all of their efforts that they put on. Um, so are we also creating intentional routes for staff to be able to contribute their ideas and suggestions? And again, are these ideas then being implemented into practice at their organization? Also thinking about the work environment. Is this a work environment that 
motivates you to get up in the morning and come to work? Is it somewhere that's a happy place to work? Or is it just draining? Um, I think we've all had those positions where you, you know, thought about going into the office and felt this sense of possible dread um, because it wasn't a fun, supportive place to work. I was recently at an organization in one of the states that we contract with and really saw a lot of these pieces put into action. Um, one of the coolest things that I had seen was that administrators had really thought about this self-care aspect for staff. And so they had created for staff a Zen room where they could go and take a break um, if they needed, just to have a quiet place, a coffee and snack bar. They had success stories posted around the office and even structured time for staff to be able to play games together. Um, so, for example, they had four square at four o'clock, which I also got to partake in and found that to be um, a really, really great experience. And it really lent itself to that organizational climate and culture that was aligned with those values and wraparound. We also need to ensure, again, that those organizational values do align with the practice model and that staff have a clear understanding of what is and what is not acceptable behavior. So again, have we thought about, as an organization, our non-negotiables? And are these being clearly communicated to staff? Again, it's also crucial to look at how we're orienting and training new staff. Uh, for example, is everyone from the receptionist to the CFO held to the same standards? Does everyone buy into the values of the process and the organization? How are these things being communicated internally? How are families and youth being talked about when no one's watching? Are we family friendly or do we fall back into the blaming and shaming? Um, what is your organizational value around using jargon and referring to families as clients and consumers? So these are all key pieces to consider. Next slide, please. Additional areas that also need to be considered is how we organize ourselves internally. So traditionally what you'll see in community mental health centers is that we tend to organize around funding streams for various programs. I like to call this the silo effect. So when we think about retaining quality staff, it oftentimes requires that we reconsider this structure and begin looking across the entire organization to determine, determine what we have um, available internally and how we can reorganize our programs and services to more effectively serve populations rather than programs. Um, again, this allows staff to really feel like they've specialized in a particular intervention or approach and ensures that they have access to everything being offered by the organization. So, for example, TFCBT may be provided within that community mental health center, but is it available to the populations that need it, or is it only available to families that qualify under a particular grant or funding source? Another organizational challenge that can often impact retention is um, when staff have families that have to fail up the system to get what they need. Again, this creates a cycle where staff often feel like they've failed themselves. Um, they failed the family, they failed as care coordinators or family partners, and this can lead to increased burnout um, and feelings of frustration, apathy, and even defeat at times. Um, considering, again, around retention is the fact that care coordinators and family partners really do need to have supervisors that have the knowledge and the skills to be able to help them develop and grow um, in their roles. So what does supervision look like? Does it consist of just staffing cases with a supervisor and kind of being told what to do with each family? Or is it really focused on building and cultivating skills and competencies that's going to help staff function more independently and will be able to be applied across all families and teams? Also, are staff feeling supported to build those competencies? If they do, they'll feel more confident in their jobs and be more likely to stay. And finally, do the policies and procedures that we have in place actually support what staff are expected to do? So again, do these policies and procedures allow for flexibility of scheduling by staff? Um, does the paperwork align with current efforts? Um, or is it outdated and carried over from previous initiatives? Um, are policies aligned with the roles and responsibilities that staff have, or are they still focused on some of those positions they may have had previously in the organization prior to wraparound coming in, um, such as case management or clinicians? And are they being evaluated and held accountable for their current job duties, um, again, rather than some of these previous roles they may have served in? Next slide, please. So again, 
and I'm just kind of piggybacking on what Kim is saying, um, good supervisors really do create um, good environments where staff really want to stay, staff really want to learn to build new skills and to apply these skills because they're enjoying what they're doing. And so if we have clearly defined roles of various staff members, then they know what to expect of them. Um, being able to assure that staff are staff competence within the practice. And so again, making sure they have uh, opportunities to not only build sort of skill around these different components of the process, but feel successful at every level. Um, and part of that is in a supervisory role, and I've seen it done really well in lots of states that I work in, um, but being able to provide that psychoeducation. Um, maybe if you have group supervision time, I've seen um, in South Carolina where I work, I have a group that actually brings in specialists from the community. They brought in some people from child welfare to talk about the different programs so that they know it's out there and so that they can have, um, they can build some confidence around that and be able to take that to their child and family teams so that families have access and information so that they have a voice in this and they own their care. Um, bringing different specialists to talk about um, very specific things, maybe trauma-informed care, just so that staff really do feel confident um, in knowing what kinds of resources are out there and, and what kind of um, therapeutic intervention may work best with uh, the families that they're serving. Um, and can we, can we communicate those expectations? As a supervisor, can we communicate those expectations and be really clear about what these are? Um, having coaching that um, having coaching and having connections to those expectations and values and coaching to those desired behaviors and so can they model those things so just uh, like Kim was saying you know are we using what kind of language are we using and as supervisors are we still referring to um, the families and the caregivers that we work with the youth and families are we referring to them as clients or are we referring to them as youth that we're partnering with um, and not caseloads but families that we're working with in our communities um, and so doing some of that correcting of staff behavior. Um, as supervisors, can we take this uh, data that we're collecting along and can we make some decisions based on that? So really um, making these data-driven decisions based on the information that they're collecting. And so being intentional about the kinds of information that you collect and being able to really have some expertise around those tools that we use in supervision and coaching. Um, and again, taking that data, looking for trends, and then analyzing that. Do we need to have group supervision around some of these trends? Or maybe partner some of our facilitators with one another for that peer-to-peer -peer learning if there's someone who's doing something really well um, and, and doing some of those kinds of things. So you know, thinking about what are the minimum expectations for facilitators and for parent-peer partners and supervisors. Um, and that comes directly from the NREC supervision model. And so that's, uh, that's exactly what uh, Kim and I do around the country. When we work with our states, we do a lot of hands-on, um, just like Janet was talking about, we do a lot of hands-on practice. We give feedback around that. We give opportunities for coaching. We come on site and we do some virtual coaching as well so that we're always emphasizing the component and the skill that they're learning and helping them to transfer, helping supervisors to transfer that skill then. Um, and so being sure that we're looking at data, are, we, are they developing skills that they need to develop effectively? Do staff know what they, um, do staff feel like they know what to do and how to do it? Do they feel supported in that? Um, and so um, as a national coach for South Carolina, um, they have done, I can tell you it's been my pleasure to work with them, and they've done some, um, some pretty cool things. So I think that they are, after we do this poll, um, they're going to be able to tell you some of the things that they've done in their state. Yes, indeed. So we started the webinar off saying that we, let, let's go ahead and launch the poll. This is going to be the last one we do, I think. See what people think about their wraparound initiatives um, status on this type of human resource support, um, specific to individual and group supervision. Do your staff receive regular individual and group supervision? And does that also consist of live observation from supervisors and feedback um, that uh, staff can use to improve their skills? While you're finishing uh, that um, poll, just want to hand it now over. Indeed, we've uh, heard a lot today thus far with increasing amounts of detail about ways to actually organize systems and programs to be more supportive of staff. 
And so now we're going to hear from uh, Bina Peak, who is the Client Services Director at the South Carolina Continuum of Care, who works with the National Wraparound uh, Implementation Center, and uh, Trina Cornelson, the Executive Director of the South Carolina Continuum of Care, and they're going to share their specific experiences of applying some of these ideas. Um, what's our poll answers, John, before we hand it over to Bina and Trina? Okay, I'm closing the poll now. So this is interesting. With each poll, we've seen more and more folks saying that they're definitely there. Um, Caseload sizes are perhaps the, less, the least well-developed, um, but training and coaching, we had almost half saying, yes, definitely we do that, and now we have over half saying that there's regular uh, supervision, including live observation, which is fantastic. Trina and Bina from South Carolina, take it away. Bring us home. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to... I'm just going to give you sort of an idea of um, a picture of us. So we're a um, program, state program in South Carolina with four regions. We have a legislative mission to coordinate care for children with the most severe and complex emotional or behavioral health challenges. Um, and I would say historically we've been seen as a, the placement agency. So it was very important um, when the previous director made the decision to move to wraparound. Um, I believe our success started with her drawing a very clear line um, in that this was what we were going to do and um, making it clear that Continuum of Care was committed to becoming a wraparound agency and would do so with fidelity. Um, we began wraparound training in February of 2014. And it began with training all of our current staff at once together. And Bina was here for that. I was right. not. Um, she said that it was difficult. <laughs> Everybody was a little hesitant. Um, but the director then addressed staff, from my understanding, in a supportive way um, and asked them to really consider whether this was a shift they wanted to make and to stay with the agency, um, that this was the direction we were moving and it may not be for everybody. Um, Bina thought that training everyone together um, really created sort of a bonding experience and um, it was kind of like the agency was going to struggle together as a team. This was new for everybody. I, I now would, this is Bina, y'all, and I just wanted to add that when we said we trained everybody, that was the person who answers the phone in the office as well. So um, we saw each region as a team, and then we, in a vital role, would be that administrative person who's your first contact with the office. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a very strong leadership focus um, on changing are focused to implementing wraparound. So our position descriptions and job duties changed to reflect wraparound language. Our staff evaluations changed. Bina, the client services director, her entire job was reshaped to support implementation of wraparound. Um, so we were very focused and committed to, to making this shift. Um, we restructured each of our regions to support wraparound. Um, we have a regional director, two wraparound case supervisors, and we even created a position called the RAP team leader, um, who will also be coaches and help support um, wraparound implementation. Um, it also, those RAP team lead positions created promotions for staff, um, and there was some incentive there for people to sort of step up and be leaders in that way. Um, we also gave current staff who were having to make this transition to wraparound 5% raises when they completed wraparound training as an incentive for to hang in there with us while we made this, this change. Um, each region really created a vision and integrated the principles into the work that they do in their region. Um, so some strategies that we have had um, in terms of hiring, we, our hiring is done regionally. 
Um, we have added some supplemental questions to our applications which assess for values that we believe are important in wraparound. Um, and our interview questions are starting to change to assess for those values such as how comfortable are you interacting with family members as equal partners, asking people to give us examples of how they've done that in the past, and what would they find challenging about doing that. Um, a couple of our regions um, are having RAP facilitators participate in interviews and, as mentioned earlier, having um, applicants facilitate a mock CFT meeting to really assess for skill, those facilitation skills. And I think we have learned over time that giving an honest description of what wraparound entails and the intensity helps applicants make a more informed choice when they're deciding whether to accept the job or not. Um, that's really important that people understand what they're getting into basically. Um, in terms of retention, we reached a point um, where we were definitely firmly on the road. Um, I visited each region and had the opportunity to sort of take a temperature reading with each peer group on where we were um, and was able to find out that people were committed and um, accepted the model and believed in the model. Um, so we knew we were at, we were firmly on the road and we could start looking at how we needed to support staff better. What did they need? Um, Let me see. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was a significant step that the leadership, uh, Trina and I and other state office staff, did have to keep our fingers on the pulse, so to speak, of what was going on with the regions. And we had to make shifts in the way we were responding to the regions. And it was her efforts to be out there listening, you know, pretty much following those principles that, that, that the staff learned they had a voice and a choice in how we were going to move into this next phase. And, and that's when I believe things started to stabilize, and that happened right about a year in, in the wraparound for us, right Earlier about February. This year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so with the feedback that I got from the regions, we have started to really reevaluate some of our job expectations to make sure that, you know, that people can be successful. We're reevaluating caseloads. Um, we're actively implementing some of their ideas, um, working on connecting the regions more and making us an, a real team rather than broken up into four regions. Um, we've really started trying to celebrate staff and their accomplishments. They have been working very hard um, to make this transition to wraparound and we are starting to try to highlight staff and, and what, what they've been doing. Um, challenges mm -hmm. um, are always there. Um, we always have difficulty finding licensed staff for the positions we want to have um, licensed people in, which would be those supervisors. It's always a challenge to find licensed people for us so that we can have some clinical oversight. I would say one of the more difficult things has been to really change the culture of blaming the family and moving towards focusing on functional strength mm -hmm. and really owning our part in engaging families. Um, that's, that's probably been a real challenge for us. Um, letting go of that expert role after being case managers for years and um, really turning that control over to families um, is a challenge sometimes. Um, one thing we've discovered is that even when you hire someone or you have staff who have the values inherent in wraparound, they may not necessarily have those facilitation skills um, to conduct the meetings and they lack confidence there. So we have um, we're in the process of getting some training for all of our RAP facilitators um, on just general facilitation skills to help them with that. It's a challenge uh, because we bill for Medicaid targeted case management, but we're providing wraparound. 
so we have the challenge of training staff and wraparound fidelity and then also how to bill for targeted case management and that's confusing for staff at times but we're working on that um, we have discovered um, through a couple hiring phases we've had that it is much better to take your time and hire the right person than to try to hurry up and get them in for that next intro training, <laughs> which we've tried to do a couple times. Um, it's, it's much better to get the right person from the beginning um, than it is to try to hurry and hire people and get them in for the training schedule. Um, we've created calendars to do job shadowing and some other things for people until they can get to that intro training and it's actually worked out better because they have some exposure to what we're doing and the training makes more sense when they get there. We've had up to two months of shadowing and sitting in on coaching before actually being assigned uh, families um, to begin wraparound process with. So we found that to be a plus. And we'll just share a few successes because I know we're running, um, our time is running out. But um, I would say that because of the commitment from the leadership uh, from the very beginning, and that includes state office leadership, but also includes the commitment from the regional directors, um, we have been successful in our transition from our old model of service coordination to wraparound. Um, over the last year, we've gotten better with understanding what we need to look for in applicants, and I think our hiring choices have gotten better, and our newly hired staff seem to be more committed to the model from the very beginning. Um, I think I mentioned this already, but it's much easier to hire based on values and skills that someone already has than to try to get them in and change their <laughs> values if they're not aligned with the model. Um, over time, as the stress of all this change is decreasing, our current staff really have grown to believe in the model and seen successes with families that's made them true believers in wraparound. And this really helps with newly hired staff when you've got current staff who truly believe in the model and can share the successes that they've had. Um, and our commitment to wraparound, I think, has shown in our state data. Lisa, would you say that? I would absolutely say that. I'm so proud of the data. And I was recently in um, in Columbia presenting for um, presenting with me and Trina, and that question was posed to me from one of the Medicaid folks. You know, what what do you how do you what do you contribute or what do you attribute to the success? And my answer immediately was leadership and how they structured this and how they really did make a commitment to just jump in and implement in the way that the model would suggest. And we even got, even though it caused a lot of tension um, internally and in our relationships externally with agencies who were used to us doing things a certain way, we actually got a compliment in that meeting at people can look back now and see that how necessary that was to really draw the line and commit to the model and not look back. Well, I want to thank uh, Kim and Lisa as well as uh, Trina and Bina for bringing some of the um, kind of high-level research to life in your examples. I think that some of the things that folks have emphasized, that you all emphasized about not rushing to hire uh, as opposed to taking the time to hire and cultivate skills in folks uh, before you then put them in the field are huge. Uh, you know, that you're going to reduce staff turnover in the long run and in improve the experience that families have if you're very careful from the front end. Um, and I think South Carolina has done an amazing job of really working this out in a very large scale and ambitious rollout. Trina and Bina, one question for you, and then we'll look at a couple other questions that have come through before we end. You said that you give those 5% raises to folks after they get through training, which is a really smart idea because, frankly, we see staff turnover and, and, and drop out before people even get through training because of the challenges of that and 
perhaps the you know learning that it doesn't live up to their expectations of what the job was. When at what point do you actually give that raise? Is it after they have um, been shadowed in the field for a while and and passed some of those initial skills tests, or at what juncture do they get the five percent raise? Well, let me clarify that we did that for the current staff. So once we started hiring for wraparound, we weren't able to continue that. Um, but we did it for current staff that really were having to change the way they, they did things. And we, for the RAP facilitators, we gave them the 5% raise when they completed intermediate training. And okay. for the coaches, we gave them the 5% raise when they completed the advanced training. Very good. So it was at least six months uh, to a year or, or further down the line for folks. It wasn't uh, just in the first month or two. Right. That's got to be really encouraging. Mm -hmm. And there was at least one, one question that was uh, sent in by uh, text or by chat box. And if others want to send any more in our last couple minutes, uh, Janet or John, can you read that? I'm having a hard time pulling it. Sure. Back. Uh, and I just also want to second Eric, I, I, I found this whole experience quite inspiring both from the uh, positive results from the polls and, and from hearing uh, particularly from uh, Bina and Trina about all of the uh, really the success they've had in, had in the hard work and, and thoughtfulness they put into, into what created that. So I have a couple questions here. Uh, the first one, when involving youth and families, especially shadowing in the community, how is HIPAA compliance maintained? Anybody want to take that on? Kim and Lisa, has that ever yeah. been an issue? Well, I think that those are things that, again, as you're preparing and you're determining what types of interviewing activities you're going to do, um, that, again, that would be something that would need to be addressed internally within your organization. Um, I also believe that, you know, many of the families where we're having um, applicants or interviewees come out to, these are not necessarily within the first round. Um, so again, we're kind of, we're not, we're not dragging every applicant through um, a family's home. Um, but again, those families would also have to be um, okay with that. Um, and so those are things that internally I think need to be discussed if that's a direction that you and your organization want to move in. Um, but I do know that we've had several organizations who have been able to do that effectively. Um, and obviously HIPAA is important to all of us. And so that needs to be something that is um, taken into consideration. So one of the other things, this is Lisa, one of the other things we've done is when we talk about um, that live observation and how then do you get feedback because that's part of protecting for drift. And so we want to ensure fidelity to the model and we want to ensure um, skill building in the early part of implementation. One of the things we've done has been really intentional about developing um, a consent form, so a consent for observation so that we are having conversations with families about why it is we're observing and we're not there to observe the families. We're absolutely there to observe the facilitator and to promote quality of care for the families, not only for their family that we're observing, but for families all over the state where we're working. And so they, um, at each juncture, they have an opportunity to see the notes that we're taking. Um, they have the opportunity to make us leave the room if they'd like, um, to, you know, to end participation in that. Um, so um, all of that we, we have included in um, being able to protect those type of standards as well. Yeah, and generally if families, you know, understand kind of the purpose of the um, interaction, you know, I think that that goes a long way because families also want to ensure that the individuals that are being hired on um, are going to be, you know, individuals that they would find um, helpful. Um, in working with. And so the feedback that we've received is that that has been um, both a great, great activity, um, not only to select staff, but also for families to feel again like they have um, that voice and choice um, and ownership of the process as to who's going to be hired to work with other families moving forward. And this is Dina. Um, we ran into that very early and I talked with our peer parents some about their feelings about it. And our, the outcome was that we made sure we had a consent form. We started to restrict observation at the at, uh, child and family team meeting because we did not want the observing 
person participating. And once we got the message out, the staff that sit on the back row and don't say anything, that um, believe the families became a little more comfortable. But it, it truly rested with the consent form. You don't do any of that without the consent form and, and the parent being a part of the decision. Absolutely. We all agree on that for sure. Okay, well, I think actually, unfortunately, we run out of time, um, and uh, I guess we don't really have a whole ton of questions, so I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours, but we certainly had a, a good comprehensive answer to the HIPAA question. So again, I'd like to thank everybody who was uh, in attendance, and particularly to our panel, and we look forward to being with you on our next NWI webinar. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you.